I'd like to add my welcome to everyone here this morning. It is good to see everyone. Um, I appreciate you being here. Uh, as Mark mentioned in the announcements, looks like the fog has lifted. I was not expecting it to be foggy when we woke up, and they, um, Mark and Sheila said there was a good bit of fog out. So I appreciate you being here on a, on kind of a, a cool December morning. In looking at First and Thessal, First and Second Thessalonians, and going to be turning over there uh, to where the the reading was there in First Thessalonians chapter four, you can tell there was a problem in the congregation. And the, the problem was, and it's there in verse 11, as it talks about that you aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. There were some folks in, Thessalon in Thessalonica who were not working um, like they should have been, and it's like the old saying goes, that idle hands are the devil's playground. And that's, that's the truth of the matter. Because oddly, in their idleness, and those who, who Paul is trying to address with this and trying to correct this issue, in their idleness, there were those who were actually quite busy. When you look over in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 3, it's actually up on the screen. It says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. For those who are in the adult class, that probably sounds awfully familiar to Galatians 6, do not grow weary in well-doing. And here you see this problem in 2 Thessalonians. So to tie the two passages together, 1 Thessalonians, Lead a quiet life, mind your own business, work with your own hands. But obviously by the time 2 Thessalonians was written, uh, the problem had not, uh, it was still a concern. It, it was still a problem. And actually, if you look in 2 Thessalonians, where, where that passage ends, there in verse 13, as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. This is verse 14. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. That's where that passage is found. So you see what was happening in Thessalonica, that you have those who are idle, right, about halfway in that paragraph, but they're actually, even though they're idle with their own business, they're actually quite busy in other people's business. They're busy bodies. And so, so you have these, these two ideas. And the solution to these things was back in our reading where Stephen read a moment ago when Paul says, concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. They knew these things. But Paul's just reminding them. He says, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all those, uh, to all who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And so that's why I, I gave this sermon the title I did, Increasing in Brotherly Love. And we're just going to think about having a quiet and peaceable life and being mindful of our own affairs and, and being diligent with our own affairs as well. So to go to look at the passage and to look at those three ideas, start with aspire to lead a quiet life. This is where I think the King James is actually study uses that word study here, but it's the idea of, of being diligent. That's, that's the concept. Would you say contentment is going to be a part of this? And I think it has to be. In this aspiration to, to make this quiet life our goal, contentment has to be a part of it. Godliness, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 9, says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. The world does not understand that. The world's definition of great gain is just great monetary gain. But that's not really great gain. Because in the end, guess what? Who does it all go to? You don't take it with you. What great gain is, is godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Just think about those who desire to be rich, right? And it's not those who are rich, it's those who desire to be rich. 
those who desire to be rich, they're never still. They're never still. They have not aspired to lead a quiet life. They are constantly running to and fro. They are constantly concerned with more and more. They want increase, but it's not increasing in brotherly kindness. It's just increasing in stuff. It's just increasing worldly possessions. It's just the rat race of life. That's what they're interested in. Just running the rat race of life, keeping up with the Joneses. And as I said in the bulletin, I always have to be careful because on the back page of the bulletin, you have that article written by Alan Jones. So no offense to the Joneses. But that figure of keeping up with the Joneses of, well, why are you doing that? Well, that's what our neighbors are doing. Why are you doing that? Because that's what, that's what they do. Individuals can get into that. Churches can get into that. Why do you do that? Well, that's because that's what the church down at Kettering does. Well, that's what the church down in New Albany, blah, 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 blah. And it's, no, godliness with contentment is great, is great gain. And it's true gain. So what we do is we, we learn to be still. We aspire to lead a quiet life. That's what Paul wanted for the Thessalonians, and that's what we, we strive for as well. Again, that word there, aspire, means to labor. So it's an odd thing. It's like, it's like work at this. Work at being still. Isn't that weird? Just that concept. And it's like, you have to work at being still. But that's basically how it's phrased here. Aspire, it's labor, it's strive for it, it's make it your aim. I want you to think about in the Old Testament, think about the Sabbath. If, and just think about the Sabbath. If you were given, if you were given a day of rest, if you were given a day off work, okay? If you were given a day off work, what would you do with that day off work? And different people have different, just to answer that question, what would you do with the day off? Oh, well, I'd probably go and I'd work in the yard, or I'd work on the car, or I'd clean around the house, or I'd go and I'd do this. I'd probably go to the Home Depot, or maybe Lowe's, or maybe Home Depot and Lowe's, and then I'd work on this project or that project. And I would have my day so crammed full, it would be like biscuits in a can just waiting to be bopped on the edge of the counter. What do you do when you take a can of biscuits and you knock it on the edge of the counter? And the whole thing explodes. So much for a day off from work, huh? That's how some people look at a day off from work. It's a day off from work from one thing, but they fill it absolutely full with other stuff. And it, it turns into not a, it's not a day of rest anymore. So just think about the Sabbath in the Old Testament. And that it was meant to be a day of rest that it was a holy day to, to, to refrain from working. And for us, of course, it, it, it should not be, as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, it should not be just one day a week. What he's really, what he's really addressing is a way of life. Because some people, and you may know people like this, some people go through life like a chicken with their head cut off. And granted, there, there are things we face in our life where sometimes it's like, man, we just feel like a chicken with our head cut off. But at the same time, the Lord tries to teach us to be calm. And it's like that quote, and it's not an inspired quote, but I think there's, there's truth to it. Sometimes the Lord calms the storm. Sometimes, and I would suggest always, the Lord calms the child. Right? That idea that whether the storms are raging or whether it is a flat sea, whether the water is still, the Lord wants us to be calm regardless. When Jesus went to the cross, how did he go to the cross? Silent as a sheep before the shearer. He goes to the slaughter. He wasn't, he, you know, Peter, Peter's the one who jerks a sword out. <laughs> All the other disciples, they scatter like sheep. <laughs> But the Lord, as he approaches the cross, even though he, even as it talks about his soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, his quotation to the disciples, at the same time, there's a calmness there. There's a calmness, as he says, not my will, but thine be done. That whatever we face, the trials and the tribulations, 
just the day to day, the day to day occurrences of life, that we should aspire to lead a quiet life, peaceably. Romans says, "Live peaceably amongst others, as much as lieth within us." And that's what we do. This is the aspiration to lead a quiet life. That idea, by the way, that idea flies in the face of, frankly, Americanism. Because the American dream is to do what? You got to have the big house and you got to have the picket fence and you have to have two and a half children. I don't even know how you have half a child, but that's the American dream. <laughs> two and a half kids. There's an Andy Griffith quote about that. Ask me afterwards, I'll tell you the Andy Griffith quote. It's one of my favorites. But the American dream is not to aspire to lead a quiet life. That's not the American dream. But that is God's goal, not just for us, but for all of his creation, to aspire to lead a quiet life. The second part of this passage says, talks about minding your own business. Work with your own hands. Working with your own hands as we commanded you. We'll talk more about that within the next point. But this idea of minding our own business, in Proverbs 27, verse 23, it says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. Right? It's your flocks and your herds. That, that concept in that proverb, remember, in Thessalonica, what was the problem? It was being a busybody. There were people who were so concerned about other people's flocks. Right? They weren't minding their own business. They were making other people's business their own business. And Paul says, no, that's, that's not right. You need to aspire to lead a quiet life and to mind your own business. That's not to say that we neglect others. We should not neglect others. But that is to say we should not be a nuisance to others. And this is where... Sometimes my bluntness can get me into trouble, but you have scriptures like Proverbs 25, verse 17, seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. Have you ever had someone in your life who violated that verse? You know, that idea, just that idea, is like, don't be a nuisance. Respect your neighbor's privacy. Right? That concept of respecting someone's privacy. Sometimes people have a problem with boundaries. And it's like boundaries are there for a reason. And you'll, you'll see some of the applications that we're going to make towards the end of the lesson, but just this idea. It's like we don't want to neglect others, but at the same time, we don't want to be a nuisance to others. And so there are... Just think about the family. Let, let me just put it this way. Who, who can I ask this question? Lois. Lois, can I use you for an example? If I called you every day of the week, after about four days, what are you going to do? <laughs> Lois says, oh, please help me. <laughs> I mean, we'll call each other every once in a while if we, if we have a question, if we have a concern. But, you know, some things just kind of, I don't know how y'all are, some things just kind of aggravate me. When someone calls you, and you, you pick up the phone and, you know, because people don't even talk on the phone anymore. But, you know, or someone just texts you. All right, we'll use texting. Someone just texts you and says, hi. Hi. <laughs> and then it's, how you doing? Good. Thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> Do you need something? No, I just wanted to say hi. Okay, and then the next day, hi. Um, I expect that from three people in my life, and they're all on the third pew. <laughs> all right, and we're in the house together. And I, I'll use myself as this analogy. When, when I first started preaching, I moved to Arkansas. And you can ask my wife, and this is, this is the truth. I'm calling my mom every day. When we, Because all of a sudden, I move out of state. So I start calling my mom every day. After four days, you know what she says? You got your own family. Leave me alone. I'm done with you. <laughs> she didn't say, I'm done with you. But it was her way of saying, mind your own business. Don't be a nuisance. See to your own affairs. Aspire to lead a quiet life. It was her way of saying, leave me alone. 
Stop just calling me up and saying hi. <laughs> right? Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house lest he become weary of, weary of you and hate you. A part of being a good neighbor, right? Increasing in brotherly love. Apparently a part of that increasing in brotherly love is respecting each other's boundaries and respecting each other's privacy. And a part of being a good neighbor is doing that. If you need help or they need help, that's one thing. That's one thing. And there's a proverb about that. Proverbs 27, verse 10. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend, nor go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. If you need help with something, well, good grief, my brother's five hours away. Bill's next door, though. If I need help, I can, I can ask Bill for help. And I've told Bill, if you ever need anything, just give us a holler. But you know, at, at some point, and I was talking with Bill the other night. I was back working in the woods, and he comes over, and we're talking about something. And, and sometimes people just aren't real good about picking up on cues. Sometimes I don't pick up on cues, and sometimes other people don't pick up on cues. But when I'm talking with Bill, and we just talk for two or three minutes, and we're talking about stuff, and he says, well, I've got dinner on the, I've got dinner on the oven, so I probably ought to be going. At that point, what should I do? Good talking with you, Bill. Take care of yourself. You know what some people do? I got another question for you, Bill. One more. <laughs> it's like, no. Bill was giving me the cue. Enough's enough. It's time to go. Right? We're not trying to neglect people, but we are trying to respect people's privacy and respect people's families and things like that. And so if you need help, holler. Nothing wrong with that. But beyond that, Mind your own business, right? This, this idea, um, whether we're speaking physically, I would suggest spiritually, there's also a lesson to be, to, learn, to be learned there. Remember in the adult class at the end of Galatians, where it talks about, if a brother is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Bear one another's burdens. We spoke about that. And then the next verse is, let a man examine his own work. So there's a spiritual application there too. Now certainly we are our brother's keeper. But at the same, at the same time, while we are our brother's keeper, and if someone's having trouble spiritually, at some point we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, and we have to examine our own work. We have overseers for a reason. We have shepherds for a reason. And they have their job. They have their job. But if we're not overseers, if we're not overseers, well, then that's not our job. And we examine our own work. We're still concerned about others, of course, but, but just this idea. There's applications. Aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands. And we're doing this for ourselves and for others. What I mean by for ourselves and for others, is verse 12, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. So this is how our needs are seen to, and this is how we conduct ourselves honorably amongst even unbelievers, I would suggest. Remember what, second, what the, the second letter says, if someone's not willing to work, what should they do? Then they shall not eat. <laughs> Way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And whether we're talking about men or women, there are issues here in Thessalonica and it needed to be dealt with. A quiet life does not mean a lazy life. Okay? And Paul, he doesn't want them to be lazy. He wants them to be calm and to mind their own business and to work with their own hands what is, what is good and what is proper. We want to be a part of each other's lives. We are a body. We are the body. We want to be a part of each other's lives, but not in a bad way. We want to be a part of each other's lives in a good way. We want to be hospitable, but without complaining. We want to be generous without gossiping. Okay, We want to be a part of that body without being a busybody. And so we have to respect that. We have to respect... These ideas, so we work with our own hands for ourselves and for others. And I just wanted you to think about 
just these ideas and ask yourself the question, would you describe your life as quiet? I don't know, some, some days my life could be a little more quiet. <laughs> um, some days I have trouble with this. Some days my, and it, it all goes hand in hand. Some days I'm too mindful of other people's affairs and I'm neglecting my own affairs. And so I need to get busy. Not busy with other people, but busy with my myself. And so in looking at these, these ideas, and as you, to think about applications, can we overstretch into our neighbor's life? And the answer to that is pretty obvious. There's different ways to do that, by the way. There's different ways to do that. And there, there's a lot of applications from the Old Testament that help with this, but there's other things. I'll, I'll give you just one example. Where we used to live in Indiana, we lived in a subdivision, and the houses were pretty close. And the house next door had a fenced-in backyard. And they had a yapping dog. And it yapped at all hours of the night. How do you feel about that? What was that dog? And by extension, what were those neighbors? At least as it pertains to the dog. Because they were nice folks. And they helped me out in a pinch when I needed help. But at least as far as that dog was concerned, it was a nuisance. And there are Old Testament passages that talk about that idea. If your bull gets out of its pen, if your donkey gets out of its pen, and it's known to get out of its pen, uh, you're becoming a nuisance. And so we can overstretch into our neighbor's into our neighbor's life. I, I'll, to just wax on this a little bit, I knew um, I knew of an older fella who since passed. He never mowed his grass ever. He didn't live in a subdivision, but he had neighbors, neighbors nearby. He never mowed his grass. How do you think his neighbors felt about him? What he would do is he would burn the grass once a year. Now, how do you think his neighbors felt about him? And when he passed away and someone else took possession of the house and they started taking care of the property, guess what it did to all the property values? And I'm not saying we're interested in money. I'm saying you just think about your neighbors and you try to be thoughtful of your neighbors and you try not to be a nuisance. In Proverbs, it talks about talks about the shameful woman who tears down her own house. And, and we just think about how her, in that situation, if you've ever seen that situation, how their neighbors must think about it. And so you just you try, you try to be a good neighbor. And part of being a good neighbor is living a calm life, being mindful of your own business, and working with your own hands, seeing to your own needs, so that you do not um, wrongly affect others. We can overstretch into our neighbor's life. How about overstretching into our family's life? And with this, what I'm thinking about is what is said with Adam and Eve. When Eve was created, and when it's spoken about there in Genesis, and so a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Can sometimes we overstretch as my children get older and eventually they're, eventually they're going to get married, right? Eventually they're going to get married, I hope. Start their own families. When they get married at some point, at that point, I would suggest, is our relationship going to change? And would it be very easy for me to overstretch into their lives, right? And you see, you see fathers and mothers and mother-in-laws and father-in-laws, and they start getting, they start overstretching boundaries. And it's like those boundaries are put there by God. And so it's easy to do. What does a person have to do? Lead a, lead a calm life, be mindful of your own business, and work with your own hands. And it's just easy to overstretch. Does that mean I never want to see my kids again after they move out? Obviously not. Obviously not. My point is just, are there boundaries? Yeah. Is it easy to cross over those boundaries? Yeah. 
and you become a busybody. Even in, whether we're talking about our neighbor, whether we're talking about family, it happens. We can overstretch into our brethren's life. As I've already said, let a man examine his own work. And we respect each other's privacy. I'm not sure if I've, I probably have said it since we've been here. If you call me after nine, if, if you call me after nine o'clock at night, y'all know I can be blunt. I apologize. If you call me after nine o'clock, someone better be dead. Because if they're not dead, I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> I have a I have a long story that gives that, and I'm not going to tell the whole story. But someone called me up after I had moved someplace and I'd been there for six months, and this person had lived there for thirty years. And a person calls me up at 10.30 at night, and I answer the phone, and I say, hello? And he says, hey, John, do you know a good dentist? And I said, between the two of us, I who have been here for six months, and you who've been here for 30 years, which one of us should know a good dentist? And why are you calling me at 10.30 at night? There's, there's parables that talk about that. And we spoke about it on the phone. <laughs> We can overstretch into our brethren's lives. We can, we can neglect to respect each other's privacy. Things like that. Rather than doing those things, what this passage says, concerning brotherly love, we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And apparently a part of brotherly love are these things that we're talking about. And sometimes folks just have trouble with them. I'd like to, to put it in a little bit of context as we offer the invitation. Read the first eight verses of the chapter. Finally then, brethren, we urge you, ex we urge you and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, and that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned, and test, forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. The Lord has called us to holiness. We need, each one of us, we should know how to possess our own vessel in sanctification and honor. Right? Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he says, I discipline myself, lest I should become disqualified. And so it, that's the idea, and it's, it's the concept of self-control there in verse 4. So you have self-control and you have holiness. So as we offer the invitation, we think about those things. That we discipline ourselves. We make ourselves. We deny ourselves. We learn about self-control. Turning from our sins. Confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. Recognizing He wants us sanctified and holy. Verse 13 now. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. So you have a, a distinct, a, a new thought here. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. That passage, God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. Talking about those who have passed on. When that time comes, and that, times will, that time will come for all, unless the Lord returns first. We want you to be in Jesus. You need to know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. 
And God does not call us to uncleanness, but holiness. When you pass, you know, verse 13, we do not, concerning those who have fallen asleep, Paul did not want them to sorrow as others who have no hope. Do you remember David in the Old Testament, the man after God's own heart? He lost two sons in his life. One was his son with Bathsheba. The other one was, oh, and the name just left me all of a sudden, Absalom. Absalom? Oh, I think so. I think it was Absalom. He lost both sons. Do you remember what he says about the one he had with Bathsheba? He said, I can go to him, but he cannot come to me. And he wanted to see his son again. He did not sorrow without hope. He had hope that he would see him again. When Absalom, who was a wicked man, when he died, do you remember David's reaction to that? He was inconsolable. He did not say, I will see him again. He said, oh, Absalom, Absalom. Because he knew his son was wicked. And he didn't want to go where, he didn't want to follow where his son went. Paul did not want the, Thessal the Thessalonians to sorrow as others who have no hope. One reason we obey the gospel is because we want our loved ones to have hope. I want my wife to have hope. I want my children to have hope. I want my brethren to have hope that at whatever point, at whatever point I pass, I want them to have hope and to say, we'll see him again. The only way that's possible is through Jesus Christ. The only way that's possible is through turning from my sins, coming to Jesus, putting on Jesus in baptism, and living faithfully. That's the only way we have hope. That's the only way we're saved by grace, according to Scripture. That's just one reason we obey the gospel. Another reason we obey the gospel is because of what is said in Acts 2. Save yourselves from this perverse generation, because I don't want to be lost. And we hope you don't want to be lost. And so, exercise self-control and deny yourself. The Lord has not called us to uncleanness, but holiness. And that's only through the waters of baptism. That's only through faithfulness. We learn about godly love we learn about brotherly love, and we walk faithfully. If you're here this morning and need to respond to the invitation in putting on Christ in baptism so that you yourself can have hope that there is more to this life than this life, and we look forward to heaven itself with our Lord and Savior, come forward. Come forward, come to the front pew, and let it be known, and you can be baptized. Put on Christ in baptism. Be born of water and the Spirit, and you'll have the hope that all Christians have. Please come this morning while we stand and sing.